Welcome to Spartan Up Podcast. We're here at City Field, Spartan Stadium Race. Our guest today, Todd Herman. Todd is an incredible performance coach, mental performance, and um, he's got a book out called Alter Ego, How to Harness the Superpower Within You. I'm paraphrasing there. Um, so he's going to talk to us about that. But first of all, who are us? We got Tim Nye. Right here. Good grammar. We got <coughs> Sam to my right. Cheers. Yeah, we got Johnny, right? Who are us? Who are we? Yeah. And uh, and I want to introduce Lonnie. Lonnie's no stranger to people who know Spartan. You've been around for a while. Yes. Um, talk about what's going on this weekend with Spartan X. Yeah, quick. we got the Spartan X Leadership uh, Series going on on Friday. So we have a group of leaders and executives coming in to hear from some of the, the best speakers really in the world on all kinds of topics related to leadership and the Spartan principles and some of those things. So it's a great event that we have on Friday. And so whereas we, we watched this interview, you got to see Todd actually on the stage. I did. I got to see him on stage. Very interesting. You know, high energy, believes in what he talks about, and uh, he's done a lot of great work with athletes and you name it, all around this alter ego concept, so it's really interesting. Hey, so stick around, because at the end of the interview, we're going to come back, we're going to talk about what we got from it, there are different perspectives on it, and in the meantime, you're watching, you're listening, we appreciate that, subscribe, get the word out there, you can help us help you to get your friends and family motivated, ripped off the couch. You are Todd Herman, and you're like a coach to the stars, like a like a strategist for the mind. What are you? Yeah, uh, so I've been working with uh, pro athletes, Olympic athletes. That's where I started. Is working with athletes all on the mental game. Uh, you know, peak performance strategies to help them sort of master the. The, the, the mental and the emotional side of their sport. And then uh, as I progressed through, started working with uh, executives, leaders, public figures, entertainers as well. And Do I hear a Canadian accent in there? There's a little bit of a Canadian accent in there as well. I grew up on a big ranch outside of Calgary, Alberta. So I grew up in a big rodeo family. Um, oh. And I decided after my cousin won the world championship in bull riding that um, I probably wasn't going to be able to best that. So I decided a different path was probably right for me. So you wanted to coach him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, that's a tough sport. Does the coach get um, recognition? Um, yeah, well, I think we, I mean, so I played sport too. So, uh, I mean, I played college football. I was a nationally ranked badminton player. And of course, badminton and football always go together perfectly, right? Yeah. But um, I think we get a different sense of reward out of working with the athlete. Um, and, you know, there's some people who might want the spotlight in some way, but uh, I get tremendous pleasure out of seeing people just burst through personal bests and transform into a completely different performer. And so if I was to hire you, let's say, or somebody was to hire you, I could basically, you could pretty much guarantee I'd be on the podium at the Olympics and build a multi-billion dollar company? <laughs> yeah, that's... Is I that think, simultaneously? Or? Yeah, that's. I think that's in the fine print somewhere. Um, yeah, I, I would love to be able to make that promise for people. Um, you have to, my, my point is you have to start with somebody special already. Well, you need to start with, I mean, I'm not inventing talent and skill out of nothing, right? right. Um, and people like people that just want the easy road anyway would never, ever come to me because um, it's funny. I had a, a program after probably about 10 years into my uh, business because I started in 97 where I started launching some things online. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't until... I decided to go and change the headline on the page where it said, uh, this, is, this will be the most difficult thing you will ever do in your life. Because mastering the self is the most challenging thing that you will ever do. And immediately, we brought in a completely uh, uh, different crop of people uh, into it. And because those are kind of people that wanted to grow. Anyone who, anyone who wants to do difficult things knows that it's challenging. And, right. and, and even just the supposition there is that, you know, the person that's waiting on the other side of that difficult thing is such a different version of you. And the skills, the talents, the mindset that you're going to develop is just going to propel you continuously forward. How, do you, how did you go from uh, participant, athlete, yeah. to super coach? Um, I was... Uh, I, I sort of fell into the whole world of mental game very accidentally. Um, it uh, not to get too deep and heavy on people, but uh, I came out of a experience of some bad trauma that happened to me when I was 12 years old. I was at a church camp, and um, over the course of two days, two men singled me out and sexually assaulted me over the course of a couple of days, oh. and um, you know ruined me on the uh, you know mentally definitely. Uh, you know as soon as I came home from that church camp attempted suicide by trying to drown myself in our family pool that we just put in the backyard of our farm. 
um, and battled with those things going did forward. You, did you come right out with it with the parents? or No. I actually only told my family five months ago. Wow. And yeah. you're telling me. Yeah. Well, because the only time I, the only reason I'd make it public is because I've actually dealt with it. Like I've gotten to the other side right. of it. Whereas before, even say four years ago, I mean, it was still something that bubbled up on it. I mean, I only told someone for the first time a year and a half ago, wow. um, which was my wife. And, and then even her, when I told her the, for the first time, she almost laughed a little bit because she was like, oh my, now I understand you. Like now <laughs> I know why you're, you're, right. you're triggered by certain things. Right. Um, so my point is, is I got into just trying to f latch onto any mental game strategy I possibly could to try to master that inner, those inner demons that I had going on. Because, you know, shame and guilt are massive drivers of why people do things um, in negative ways and sometimes in positive ways as well. Uh, and, and what I discovered was, which is kind of the topic of the book that I came out with uh, recently, which is the power of using alter egos and secret identities. Because what happens is, psychologically, it's disassociative. You actually disassociate yourself from your own personal narrative and your own trauma, and now you get to act to and through this different identity that you've created for yourself. And it's not about being fake, because that's, that's, it's not fake it till you make it. It's, um, it's actually tapping into psychological phenomenon that already exists. We did it when we were kids, right? Like when we pretended to be a superhero sure, and jump sure. off the couch to see how far we could go if we were Superman or when we're in the front yard and, or front driveway and we're pretending to be our favorite um, athlete. Because it, it's answering that question, what could I do if, you know, you know, if I wasn't short, what could I do if I was, you know, taller like LeBron James? And it automatically, that disassociative question allows you to find a different gear, a different performance level. And, um, and so my point was, was after I got done playing, I was, you know, like many athletes, I like, I want to stay involved in it. And I was volunteering at a high school, coaching the defensive backs. And I would spend more time like trying to help them with their mental game. I'm like, you're already working hard. Like you're already working hard and you doing more cone drills or something like that isn't going to change your performance. Um, but preparation, routine, practice, or, um, uh, just different planning, mental game strategies, visualization, relaxation, and breathing skills would really help them. And so words started to spread, and then people- you were, you, were, you were helping people with their mental game. And then people just started saying, hey, well, can you mentor my son or daughter? Because, because yeah. you, were so, you were spending so much time, so many years on your own mental game. Yeah, and I was good because of my experiences that I'd gone through. I, um, I had a high level and degree of compassion for other people, sure. which is lost in why many coaches are great at what they do. You know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of coaches that are glorified because they sound like they're hammers and they treat everyone like a nail, but they have one tool. That's it. Whereas I had, because I needed to, I had a whole host of different tools in my back pocket that I could use with each person. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And so then uh, how did you get into getting to the big guys or big girls that, how did that um, happen? It's, it's, it's like, you know, there's, uh, there's, a, there's an element of luck that's there. Uh, I, I've always been a sort of massive proponent of mentorship and apprenticeship. I think it's one thing that's massively lost nowadays. Everyone's trying to race to the finish line of, you know, being amazing right off the bat. And you got to pay your dues. Sure. Just reality of it all. Because you don't have all the skills yet. Jiro, Jiro Sushi. You know that story in Japan? Mm, yeah. Eight years cleaning rice before you get a knife. Yeah. Um, is, there's that a, you, is that what you did? There's a, yeah, there's, <laughs> well, my, my, uh, my mentor was Harvey Dorfman, who's actually, we're at um, City Field right now. So Harvey Dorfman literally wrote the Bible of the mental game world called Coaching the Mental Game. He's known as the Yoda of baseball. I spent 33 days with him, and um, I was about two and a half, three years into my career, and I was eighth day. Roger Clemens rolls in to spend a full day with him. So he let me sit in. I'm watching the best mental game coach on the planet work with one of the greatest baseball players on the planet. Next day, Andy Pettit comes in. Next day, you know, just a litany every single day of new all-stars coming in. And, you know, it massively accelerated my growth. And then Harvey started passing people my way because he was just jammed up with clients. So, so let's stop there for a second. So a young person, because this drives me nuts. It's driven me nuts for years. Yeah should find opportunities like that and work for pay actually don't even ask for money pay yeah. them yeah. to sit in yeah well that's exactly what i did with harvey i reached out to him cold because i was reading all of these other books on psychology behavioral dynamics kinesiology like i wanted the whole suite of different things and, and in fact i thought that a lot of the stuff that was talked about in psychology books was just crap like it, you can't use it on the field to play and me as an athlete that was playing at a pretty good level sure. I'm like that's just going to make me think more out there my job is to subtract, delete, and remove that stuff so that you can get into flow state. 
Because sure. flow state is all about a lack of like judgment and reasoning and thinking things through. So Harvey's stuff just made so much sense to me. So I reached out to him cold and said, listen, you know, I know that you've got a, a private practice. You're kind of one man show. I'm sure you have a lot of like administrative stuff that, you know, piles up on your desk that prevents you from writing another book or working with someone. Can I come down and take those things off of your plate for you? Um, and then when he finally called me back, he was like, you don't think you're going to live with me, kid, do you? <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 no. I said, I got a, there's a, there's a motel or there's a, sorry, my aunt and uncle who lived just down the, uh, not too far from you, I'll stay with them, which was a lie. Um, I actually stayed in a Motel 6 for $28 and about 50 cents a night. I love it. I love it. Um, but, but, he, but, but let yeah. me interrupt you. Yeah. He probably called you back because there weren't a lot of people calling him asking what you were asking, which is surprising, no. right? Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's, it's always amazed me. And even now, I tell those stories a lot to people. And there's a now it's way easier to get access with, sure. with social media to yeah. reach out to someone. And there's still very few people who do that. With because me. you don't get the calls now, right? You would think that some yeah. young person would call and say, I just want to shout at you. Yeah. It, well, I actually do. And it always happens around um, April and May. And ironically enough, I get pinged on from Penn State University graduates in athletes specifically. I don't know why that university, huh. but um, graduates reaching out to me saying, you know, hey, I'd like to have a career that was similar to yours. You know, can I come in? And I'm, you know, I, I welcome people in. You know, and again, if they approach the right way. Sure. Some people have sure. some big asks. Right. It's um, got to be frictionless. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. All right. So now you're cooking with steam. And yeah. uh, actually, why don't you and I work on my mental game? Because I could use you yeah. for a little while. Um, and then we'll come back and do the second half of this thing. Let's Is that do cool? it. Yeah. Right, I'll come back a billionaire. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if we can do that. <laughs> All right, Spartans, we'll be right back to that great episode here in a minute. But I want to take a, a quick opportunity to tell you a little bit about Special Ops Survivors. Special Ops Survivors is a, a military-themed charity that I am personally associated with and that Spartan supports. Special Ops Survivors was founded in 2002 from a single act of kindness and concern by an active duty SEAL. He returned from his first deployment in Afghanistan and unfortunately he lost one of his good friends. He was concerned about his friend's wife and uh, young child and he, he tried to figure out who was gonna help them. And from that, Special Ops Survivors was founded, dedicated to embracing and empowering the spouses of fallen Special Ops warriors. Now, that's across all military branches. That's Marine Corps, Army, Navy, Air Force. One way to uh, support Special Ops Survivors is to go to their webpage, specialopssurvivors.org, and look for Blackfish 5. Blackfish 5 is a sports supplement company that's got an array of products. If you buy any of their products, 20% of what you buy 20% of money will goes directly to special ops survivors. You've got a uh, Kratos Max, and I've been taking this personally now for maybe 10 days or so. This is really good. It, it's a real focus. It's going to help you build some core strength and give you some explosive energy. This, this is good. Let me tell you, I've been taking it, and I like it. The other one here is a, is a rebound or a recovery drink, chocolate. Tastes good. It's excellent. The other one, especially if you get a little bit older or you've done a Spartan race, it's for your joints and your mobility. Highly recommend all of these. All right, if you can, go to specialopsurvivors.org. Look for Blackfish 5. 20% of that money will go to help Special Ops Survivors, a truly worthy cause. All right, Spartans, thank you. Um, I'm not a billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> Man, this is not going to help sell any of my stuff at all. <laughs> you had 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, well... Let's let's when, when when does someone become a billionaire? I think it's you know some of that can be when you actually decide to start moving towards that if that's actually something that's important. But I mean you've got uh, a brand Spartan that I cannot uh, cannot foresee it not becoming a billion dollar enterprise. Yes. Yes. So right. yeah, well you're a soothsayer as well. Yeah. So so um, you're you're sitting in those meetings for 28 days. Yeah. For uh, 33. 30, um, 33, but it was about days. it was about 10 days of back to back to back ones with those athletes. F yeah. Fill us in on what you learn. Well, um, the biggest insight I had early on was just how little Harvey would be talking to them about their performance on the field. About 80% of the battle that they were being challenged with was actually off the field stuff. Family, you know, could be um, marriage stuff. Not that he was doing counseling or anything like that, because that was not Harvey's way. Um, you know, and I'm not skilled. I'm not a skilled, I'm not a therapist. That's not what I do. Performance is all about moving forward and finding ways to continuously you know, level up and, and, um, and, and find another gear. But it was definitely those challenges off the field. Um, we also found 
Harvey and I, because I was unpacking, it was, Harvey enjoyed it because afterwards I was, because I'm so, so curious and I was, you know, just paying attention to what was being said, there was this amazing uh, thread that was being revealed, which was there was this magical five hour window before game time that if we could manage the five hours before game, we would probably be able to help that athlete consistently perform at a high level. Because they would mention that if they're, you know, if someone was interrupting their routine two hours before the game, three hours before the game, their performance would suffer. So what happened after that was, Harvey did this with his clients, I did it with mine, was we really wanted to enlist the help of those people that would maybe cause the most emotional friction for them, you know, husbands, wives, it's easy, you know, like, you know, I want to talk about the fight that we had last night or, you know, can you pick up some eggs on the way home? I mean, those things happen. You know, they say, Hey, when you come home from the game tonight, can you pick up some eggs or something like that? Um, in, in the three hour or three hours before the game, that's not the time for that to happen. So we would enlist them to help, you know, create a shield around that athlete in the five hours because, you know, they're, they're getting, they're getting paid an extraordinary amount of money typically to perform, to perform and they aren't going to have that opportunity for a long time. So, you know, if it's eight years, if it's 10 years, if it's 15 years, let's manage that. Uh, so that was one of the things was just how much th they were needing help with managing off the field stuff. And then it was just seeing someone that's the master like Harvey, how he did, he, how he never ha like held their hand. Like he was extraordinarily brusque. He was in their faces. He would never let them give them some sort of crap excuse. And that's probably why Harvey was so revered was because he was one of the few people that you challenged talk, them. You talk straight to him, right? No, Absolutely. Because they've, no they've, got, they've got so many people around them that are yes people, just doing anything to kind of like just stay close to them. And Har that was not Harvey by any stretch. Somebody uh, the other day said something great to me, which I'm going to start applying to my life, which I think is, is the brusqueness you're talking about, which was um, people say all the time, just in jest or whatever, like, oh, I could never do that. Yeah. And this guy responds with, yeah, you're probably right. You can't. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Because then the people, what do you mean I can't? Well, yeah. you're the one who said it. Yeah. But what a fantastic right. way to argue for your own limitations. Right. And, I mean, I say this. I, I think it's one of uh, Dr. Phil's great contributions to society, which is how's that working for you? Yeah, like it's his one right. question. Right. And, I, and I think it's such a great yeah. question. How's that working for you? Right. Because it's not. The fact that you just said that means that it's not working for you. Um, and, and one thing that's really important to, to help everyone that's listening, because, you know, I, I, I like helping people find that new gear and, and one thing to always keep in mind. And that's why for me, I'm known as the quick hit artist in kind of the mental game world. I can come in when there's a athlete that's playing at Flushing Meadows for the U S open on Saturday and on Wednesday they're struggling like, or they've been going through a slump or something like that I'm the guy who would get called in because I can help shift someone really, really fast. Yeah. Um, you know, meditation, one of the most powerful long-term strategies that you could ever employ for both mental, emotional, and physical fitness. There's just, it's an incomparable thing to act, add as a, it's as, not gonna work as from practice, Wednesday to but it's not. Right. Whereas, but if you remember that we as human beings, we always act through whatever we associate ourselves with. So if you're associating yourself with a narrative and a story that, uh, well, no one from my family has ever been an entrepreneur, so you know why would I? Or you know, no one from my country or no one with my skin color can do that, or I've never seen anyone from my community do that, whatever that is, you're going, your behavior is going to show up that way. So habit change is great, and there's a lot of great books out there on changing habits, but I can shift someone far more quickly because the moment I change your identity, all that other stuff automatically shifts. That's why you know, alter egos or using a secret identity for people was such a fast way for me to help people discover a new version of what they could do. Quickly. Very fast. Because yeah. yeah, we already know how to do it. I'm not inventing anything new. Cicero said this in 44 BC, go, going back, you know, to the times of very, very tough people. One of the greatest Roman statesmen and philosophers. He's the one who coined the term alter ego. And he did it in a letter to a friend when he was um, giving his wisdom, passing along his wisdom. And the term actually means trusted friend or ally. And when you think about life, we all know, I mean, you've had success this way. My success is this way. I just got done unpacking Harvey and mentors that I've had. But we all know that having amazing people around us, allies, friends, levels us up, opens doors for us. So we all know that relationships are super important. But the one place that people have not fought 
explicitly about bringing an ally or a trusted friend into, which is the most important part, is the six inches between your ears. And that's what really I found in doing this for 16 years, building out alter egos for pro athletes, Olympic athletes, entertainers, public figures, leaders, entrepreneurs, that when someone brings that into their mind, it allows them to find a completely different level of performance. Because yeah, you're I met, not. I met a, tell me if I'm, I'm on the right path here. I met a woman uh, yesterday. We were filming in New York City, and uh, she was smoking. Yeah. And I'm carrying my kettlebell, so I walked up to her and I wanted to dig in on the smoking thing. Like, what? Well, she goes, you know, I've quit a bunch of times, but when I'm driving in the car, I smoke. Yeah. And I said, well, what if you change that story? What mm -hmm. if you started right now by saying, yeah, when you're driving the car, you don't smoke. Yeah. And is that what is that yeah. what we're saying here? Or no, what? Uh, how would you act if you step if you sat behind the wheel and you were Wonder Woman on the way home? I like that. Would yeah. Wonder Woman? What would Wonder Woman do? Right. right. It, just, it, it just again the one superpower that human beings have. What's the most popular genre of movies nowadays? Superhero Superheroes. movies. Right. Why? Because there's this universal narrative that really sort of latches on to to us that hero's journey, Joseph Campbell sure. type thing. Um, but it's also because we all kind of were like, man, it'd be so cool to have a superpower. I mean, mine, I would love to be able to teleport. I mean, that would be amazing. We could be having this discussion yeah, yeah, yeah. on a beach somewhere in Bora awesome. Bora. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but we actually do. And it is our creative imagination. It is truly the only thing that makes human beings unique on this planet. Love doesn't. Caring for others doesn't. I'm not saying those things aren't powerful, but they're not what makes us unique. Other animals love, other, people, other animals care. But we are the only animal on this planet. We're the only living thing on this planet that can create a heaven from hell, a hell from heaven. That can create stories and narratives in her own head. I don't know. My dog kept thinking she was human. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. She's tapping into that, uh, that alter ego. Um, and so the creative imagination is so powerful. Kids use it just incessantly from the ages of zero to seven. Why? Because their brain is caught in what's called theta brainwave state. Theta brainwave state is basically the direct access back door to the creative imagination. And then what happens? We start to get told to act our age. You know, we look at other adults and we kind of want to grow up a little bit faster. And we look at, you know, how they're, um, how they act. They seem more serious. And so we think that we've got to act that way. And we start layering on behaviors and attitudes that don't actually serve us if we're trying to pursue things that are important to us. And... And so I'm, I'm on this massive mission of reminding people of the power of their creative imagination and how it is the superpower that we have and how you can very, very quickly shift what you're acting through by shifting the identity inside. If you're speaking to somebody, you, you got yeah. called in right now. There's a baseball game this weekend. Yeah. Go through the process. So first thing, like what this player is walking back and forth, distraught, what, tell me what's going on. Yeah, so the first place I want to start with is, well, A, we always uh, have, our, our identities are always in context to the role that we play or the field of play that we're on. Like, n no one denies to me that they don't have multiple roles, right? I've got, I'm a dad, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a coach inside of my, my business, I'm a leader of my team and all that. So I always ask them first, okay, well, what's frustrating you? Because now I know it's the role as a baseball player, so that's the field of play that we're standing on. What's frustrating right now about the way that you're playing and the way that you're showing up, okay? Then I want to flip that. Well, how do you most want to be showing up? And don't answer the question through what you believe you can do because now you've automatically limited yourself. You know, if I asked you that question and you thought of your greatest superhero inspiration, Ask, answer that question through how Superman would answer that, or Thor, or whatever. Or you can answer it, but how do you most want to be showing up? Well, I want to be stepping up to the plate, supremely confident and very, very calm. Like, I want to be so dialed into just the process. Great. So I want to find out and unpack what are those kind of superpower qualities or superhero qualities that you want to be showing up as and with? And then, is there someone that already inspires you with those qualities? Is there someone that you think already possesses those things? So example, I had, uh, uh, one of, like, again, one of my clients, she's actually in the world of equestrian dressage, which is like, you know, yep. horse dance. Yep. Um, you know, very, very specific moves. And you talk about a very difficult sport. It's, the, it's one of the few sports where, you ha where you're riding on an animal that perfectly transmutes your emotional energy. That's why horses are used in therapy. And so now you need to go and do very intricate moves out there and... If you're nervous or anxious, you're gonna have a nervous and anxious horse. So for her, very strong woman, type A personality, ran her own business, but she would get on the horse and she'd be so concerned about what the judges were thinking of her, okay? So now she's out of the performance. 
you can't control that stuff that's out there. So I needed, we needed to bring that energy back within. Um, and then her, her horse would, you know, be a little bit jittery too, miss his mark and things like that. So I asked her, she's like, who, like, is there someone that inspires? Like, is there, if you could show up one way, what she, and immediately she went to Wonder Woman, the Linda Carter version of Wonder Woman, because this is several years ago. Not the new one. Yeah, not the new one. And, uh, and I said, well, why? Why, why, that, why that person? She's like, because she owns her space. She always stands her ground, and there's nothing that she doesn't feel that she can't handle in the moment. Okay? I'm like, brilliant. And I mean, I know that I found the right alter ego of someone when I can see their state change, when I can see them almost get like goosebumps with the way that they're talking about that person. So anyways, you know, we, we unpacked what that was. I'm like, okay, so when you go out there, let's say you went out and you sat on that horse as Wonder Woman. I want to help someone create a totem and an artifact because physical objects help us activate things. It actually ties into a psychological phenomenon that we all have called enclosed cognition. We as human beings ascribe story and narrative to the clothing that we wear and other people wear, all right? Um, there's probably no group of people that does a better job of purposefully creating a story around clothing than the military. You know, every single day, those soldiers are being told the narrative of what the credo is of someone or the, the motto or what it means, the values that we have, right? So then when you put it on, you're shifting, you're changing as you put it on. So. We went out and she got a, uh, a, she created a Wonder Woman bracelet for herself. And when she snapped it on, that's when she was activating that Wonder Woman identity out on uh, her horse. And, I, and the final step is to act with extraordinary intention with it. And, um, and I'll tell my story of how I use this. When I played football, um, Todd never went on the football field. Uh, my alter ego was Geronimo. I'm a massive, where I grew up in Canada, rich Native American history where I grew up. Um, in fact, when Sitting Bull, after the Battle of Little Bighorn and Custer was killed, uh, they fled to our family's area, and then they went and settled in southern Saskatchewan. So we had, you know, fire rocks and rings all around, but I've always been connected with that world. But I had this mental movie theater that I'd go into when I was in the locker room. I'd walk into that mental movie theater through the one door, and there was two doors in the back of that mental movie theater. And in through one of the doors would walk Walter Payton and Ronnie Lott, two of my football heroes. Um, and then through the other door would walk five Native Americans, uh, led by Geronimo. And they would walk towards me, and Geronimo would be holding five trading cards, um, three of Walter Payton and two of Ronnie Lott. And so they would all approach me, and, Ro and Walter would say to me, as Geronimo would reach out and hand me the cards, take each of these cards as a representation of each of us and take our traits out on the field. And just as I would grab it in my mind, Geronimo would tug back on the cards slightly and Walter would lean in and say, but don't you dare for one second dishonor who we are and how we would show up by not showing up like we would out there. And then I'd take the cards, and sitting next to me would be five trading cards. And I'd put one of Walter Payton's in my helmet, stuff it in. I'd take the other two of Walter Payton's and stuff them in my thigh pads, because I wanted to run like him. And I took the other two of Ronnie Lotts, and I would put them in my shoulder pads, because I wanted to hit like him. He's a devastating hitter. I hope you don't tell me at the end of the game you cut your finger off. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the, the man that was, t he was tough. Um, and... Uh, and then when I would put on my helmet and snap the, the chin strap, that's when I would take the spirit of the Native Americans into my heart. And that's how I would show up out there, is with all them. Now, what's key in that process is, again, I think one of the challenges that people have to battle with nowadays is there's a lot of advice about how you should act and how you should behave. And there's a lot of psychological stuff that's out there that, does, that runs completely counter with how the brain actually works. So what we're actually tapping into, this when, into, into with this when, when I say honor, is, Joe, you will do more things for other people than you will for yourself. You will want more things for other people than you will for yourself a lot of times. And so that's what we're tapping into, is I revered and loved those people that I was honoring out there. And so that's what I was tapping into, because there was not a chance in hell that I was not going to show up like they would um, when I went out there. And in the opening of the book, I talk about Bo Jackson. Let's talk about the Bo Jackson hat. I and, story. and 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 Bo Jackson, his uh, his he's probably got one of my favorite alter egos of all time. But we were both speaking down in, uh, or I don't know if he was speaking, but he was at the, this same event that I was at in, in Georgia. And I was in the green room, ready to go, ready to go on stage uh, in about 15 minutes. And you know, in walks Bo. And this is a while ago. 
And I was like, oh my God, there's a guy who I played on Nintendo as a kid all the time. Um, you know, if you didn't know, he was the cheat code on Tech Mobile. Uh, you could hand him the ball and he wouldn't be tackled. So anyways, he approaches me and he said, hi, you know, hey, I'm Bo Jackson. I said, yeah, I know who you are. I wouldn't be a very good person in sport if I didn't know who Bo Jackson was. But um, he said, oh, what are you talking about today? And I said, oh, I'm going to talk to them about, you know, the mental game, but specifically how to use an alter ego to really step out onto the field as the person you most want to be so that you don't play down on the kind of rung of the ladder that many people do. And he looked at me and he kind of cocked his head to the side and he said, Bo Jackson never played it down on football his entire life. And I said, interesting, tell me more. And he was like, well, the people who know my story know that, you know, growing up I was a pretty angry kid, battled with my emotions a lot. Sounds like that would probably work out well for you if you're on the football field, but for me, I would actually take maybe silly penalties or stupid penalties, get too emotional, wouldn't be that coachable. And so one night I was watching a movie and I saw this character come on the screen that was cold, calculating, methodical, unemotional. And I thought to myself, wait a second, what if I took that with me out onto the football field? And it was Jason from Friday the 13th. Um, <laughs> nice. And, and nice. that's why, I, and that's why I, it's funny, because people go, a serial killer? That's what he's, he's angry and he's going to become that? And I'm like, but this is the power of the human mind. His takeaway was unemotional. And what was he on the field that was getting in his way? He was too emotional. emotional right. So when he went out there, his sole mission was to destroy anything that got in his path with no emotion whatsoever. Um, and so Jason lived on the football field, and when he went out there, he had he would, when, the moment he stepped on the field, that's when Jason would enter him. And, and so that's the power of this, is it silos things very well. And now you can start to build a custom-built life where you don't see yourself as one identity. That's actually extraordinarily unhealthy mentally if you have one identity. Thus, we all have thus, multiple. Thus the Avengers. Yeah. We, we, right? We can take what we need. Take what you need. And then, you know, at home. I'm a challenger personality. I mean, I work with, you know, hard-charging, high-achieving people all day long. But when I go home, that's the last thing my three little ones want is that. They don't want to challenge your dad. Sure. You turn so into my, Hello Kitty. My, yeah, <laughs> close. My inspiration is Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers. Nice. 100%. You know, bring a more gentle self to my kids. Be more playful and fun and all that. I, so. love, I love this. Uh, you gave me some great ideas, yeah. not only for myself, but for my kids. Well, think about, think about the Spartans, the people who show up for the yeah, events. That's right. You know, they're showing up with, you know, limitations, possibly of doubts about what they th – don't show up with that. Show up as, like, you know – you know, as you're showing Leonidas. up as a Spartan. That's right. showing, exactly. Like, you, yeah. you've custom built it into the brand, which, right. is, so, which is what makes it so powerful sure. and why so many people, I think, get such a fantastic transformation on the other side of an event. Yeah. Yeah. You're awesome. Thanks, uh, man. The book, Alter, The Alter Ego Effect. No need for the book, I guess, because we watch the podcast. But if you want... <laughs> <laughs> you do such a terrible job of selling books, man. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many more stories. I talk in there about, like, how to actually battle the enemy within, you know, how to really build this out so it's powerful for yourself, and uh, lots of stories and the science behind it all, too. Cool. Yeah. And there's a bunch of superheroes inside. Yeah, absolutely. All right. You're awesome. Thanks, Thank man. You. Thanks for Thanks coming. Thanks, Appreciate it. great. I love the alter ego idea, right? Because I don't think that it's fake. And I think that like you can just embody the things that you want to bring to a scenario. My person, I think I would choose Sybil Luddington. 16 years old, Revolutionary War, right? The troops are coming. And the father's the head general of all the troops. And like, I think, oh, it's Connecticut. I love Connecticut. Okay. And he's going, who can ride in the middle of this moonless night to let all the troops know? I have to stay here and get everyone fortified. And like young Sybil Luddington's like, I'll do it. So I think like that's really yeah. the ethos well, I embody when I go, go out sea oh, hunting. Oh, okay. So you, you are, <laughs> he's, like, he's your alter ego. I was wondering Sybil what. Sybil Letting, he's a female. Oh, well, see, I, okay, great. They don't get it. I don't, I don't, don't, I don't well, me. I it don't know matter. military history that well. So I was a little bit, <laughs> 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 a little, a little bit off on okay, that. Okay, I digress. Something that Todd talked about that I really liked uh, in his business is he said when he changed his tagline to the hardest thing you're ever going to do, the great thing about that is he said he's attracting people who want to do the work, who really want to put in the effort. So, you know, everyone is out there looking for the easy way, and there's lots of people on TV trying to hawk the easy way. We're not about the easy way. We're about grit. We're about resilience. We're about digging in. So I like that he said that, um, that when he changed his tagline to the hardest thing you're ever going to do, he got the people that he wanted to work with, the ones who were willing to do the work. I like this. I like this idea that he has about that um, sometimes you need a hack, right? And, and the idea about if you can't do it, What's the hack? And this idea of tapping into something else. Um, I know we, we had a little conversation earlier, too, about um, 
about, and, and he mentioned it when he, he was in the interview, is, is it real, is it artificial, is it whatever? He was at the, the Spartan X Leadership Series, and one of the things that caught me in relation to the alter ego is things that you wear as triggers to remind sure. you maybe of somebody else that was a high performer or to remind yourself to perform at a high level. I wear red shoes, you know, yeah, sure. and those yeah, red you. shoes remind me of certain things. So not quite the alter ego, but it does trigger, you know, some things inside of me from a performance standpoint. And Tim, you, you talked about uh, how you have different Colonel personalities. Dentrick. I want to hear about this. No, no, I'll get to that. But also I want to say, listen, who, who am I? Yeah. Who are I, you? Who am I? I am Spartan. There you go. Oh, yeah. oh, absolutely. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> if we are at the start line, and I'm standing here, and I've got a race going on over my shoulder, yeah, yeah. and I've got a TV over my left shoulder, I've got a TV in front of me, all watching Spartans run, half of them are in helmets, kilts, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of alter egos I'm looking at right yeah. now that are wearing them for, you know, maybe it's for fun or maybe it is to get over that. Finish. 100%. Yeah. The Renaissance sure. Fair fitness So it is here. like anything else. While I, I believe that there are degrees, uh, you know, um, of it. Uh, for me, when I was listening, I was saying, okay, but I'm already, I spent the time in the military. So a uniform already kind of makes that transition for yep. me. Yeah, right? 100%. As I was saying, you know, Colonel Nye is much different than Daddy. Yeah. You yeah. know, or, you know, we all have different personas that we use at different times. And you have to kind of know when to tap into those things, right? People will say to me, like, oh, I even go back before I was an Army Colonel, when I was a Marine. Are you still a Marine? Well, when you forced me to be. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you if you want me to be, I'll be, yeah. you know, but but that that's not how I go through the normal day. Yeah. Yep. Right. Well, so I so it's there. And the, he talked the artifact and the token, which you were kind of hitting on. And I, and I believe on that. I mean, you know, many guys inside their helmet going off the war have either a flag or, or something that they can touch and remember. To, to put them in a different mindset. I mean, I have a whole medicine pouch. You know, TSA loves that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we don't understand. When, when we travel, yeah. when we travel with Steph, we say we'll meet you at the gate. It's going to take a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, you even, our, even our producer, right, wears a totem, right? She's yeah, got it on. She's got it on. Objects have our embodied man. intention. There's right? power. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and I really is. like what you said about triggers, you know, because oftentimes um, in the wilderness skills schools, okay, they say, you know, every time that you pass a certain type of plant or something, use that as a time to like stop and take a look at your surroundings, right? And so, like, we need these different cues and things to just cue our minds, like brain yeah, plastic. But maybe we would have got through the baton in eight hours and not 10 if we hadn't, yeah. beli oh, that's but my if we hadn't believed in that. So, something else. <laughs> oh, so go yeah. ahead. Same. Well, no, I was going to say my father uh, was a professional wrestler, right. and his yeah. persona, his alter ego, was right. Moondog Main. Yeah, but he didn't come home as Moondog Main. Right. Kind of to your yeah, point, yeah. you know. So right. probably at a, a different level, but it was always interesting. Yeah. yeah. What's fun about that though, too, the idea that he's out there and he's playing this character and plays a key word. Todd talked about um, how the superpower that we all have is creative imagination. And that, and that we give that away, that when we're kids, yeah. uh, he didn't say yeah, this did exactly, like but I, this is the way I wrote it down. Kids use it, why lose it? Like, kids use this every day. They go out and, I'm going to be Wayne Gretzky in the, in the, in the driveway with a hockey stick, right? And, um, but what happens is we take on other people's limitations, other people's expectations, and we allow that to define us. So if what it takes is instead of being Johnny Waite, who already has decided who he is and what other people think I am, but I want to be more than that, why wouldn't I say... Who, who, I, I'm going to give you a great example of this. A real, it's a kind of a funny personal story. Years ago, I got well, we'll asked. Be, we'll be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> years ago, I got asked we'll to go. See. Years ago, I, I got asked to go to a networking event, and it was for second year university students in a business program to learn how to network. So they invited a bunch of connected people out. And that night, about an hour before him to go, I got this weird chip on my shoulder. I didn't want to go. I don't know. This is stupid. Teaching people how to network. This is stupid. I thought, well, what, what is it? You just don't want to put on a suit. So I didn't want to put on a suit. So I thought, okay, screw it. I'm going to go in a leather jacket and jeans and a white T-shirt like the Fonz, and I'm going to show them how to network. And now I'm sitting in my car outside this event looking at all these people in their suits going, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Total lack of confidence at this moment, right? True, this is a true story. This is exactly what he's talking about here. I sat in the car, and I thought, you can't do this. And I thought, who could do this? Who could go in there right now and own this exactly like you are? I thought, George Clooney. George Clooney would go in there, dress like this, and he would own that I room like nobody has ever say. owned that yeah. room. Right? Yeah. No, no, but seriously, because Johnny right. Waite, in that moment, Johnny Waite could not do it. He yeah. couldn't. He's sitting in the car. He doesn't want to go in there. He feels like such an idiot. Yeah. I sat there, and I'm, I'm not kidding. I took 10 breaths, and every breath I thought, I'm going to be more like George Clooney than I was before this breath. Self-hypnosis, right? By about eight breaths in, I'm feeling like George Clooney. 10 breaths in, I walked in. I swear to God, crushed it. 
didn't talk about me at all. It was about them. About did them. you did you look like George Clooney more? Do you think? I head. think I looked yeah. more like him than when I started. <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 it was a great example yeah. of where, if in that moment you don't feel like you can do it, who can? Right, right? and you. You take that on, you take that power with you. So I, I think, in, in a sense, that's, that's what I got out of it. So, yeah, cool. Because I think, I mean, if you think about it, right, just to reference back on that, epigenetically, right, we have all this remembrance and all these genetics from all our parents, from our grandparents, from our ancestors, right? And some of them were the actors or the she grain millers. The syllable, or, she? oh, <laughs> excuse me, George Clooney, I believe I was finishing my point. <laughs> but all I can say is, like, Whoever you want to be, there's probably some point back in your genetic lineage and history that has that. So it's not faking it. It's like tap into what feels real, and there's something there. I love seeds and grains. My grandfather had a grain mill in Norwich, Connecticut. You start going back and back, and you realize, like, there's a reason why I feel and I resonate to these things. So what feels right resonate to you. We saw a guy running in a T-Rex suit here. Yeah. Awesome. Be the T-Rex. And uh, the I guess we'll, we'll, see, you, we'll see you next time here on <laughs> Never Lose Your Dinosaur, Spartan Up the Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Spartan Up. If you have goals, we're here for you with daily tips to keep you on track and interviews every Tuesday with inspiring, motivating people. The only thing we ask of you is to push yourself and push your limits and to help us get the word out. We're on a mission to rip 100 million people off the couch and give them the tools to keep going. So please tell your friends about us. Subscribe. Share it if you like this episode and let us know what you think. Are we on the right track? You can find us on Instagram at Spartan Up Podcast. See you next week. Bye.